When Steel Talks, everybody listens. A little bit and have the vocals sit a little bit more present in the mix, because I felt like at times they kind of fell away and were a little bit, they could have come forward a little bit more, and that was something they also had agreed with. So um, I can show you some photos. So here's a, a picture of my Sequoia session, the two songs that I'm working with are right here. So this is the, the flat transfer. Um, this is from the tape, and this is what I ended up delivering to the client. Um, so it's a little bit louder. Just <laughs> um, <laughs> a little bit. Um, so that, and then I also actually, is this the right one? Yeah, that's my recall sheet. So you can kind of see what I did. Um, the the basketball, uh, basketball, we have a, uh, an STCH screen song. Um, this is how I kind of notated what I did. Um, this is a neon PSP. Uh, felt like it was a good opportunity to say that as much as we don't want to have to make things loud, as much as we loathe the fact that our jobs have become, you know, wrangling every half a decibel out of a master, it's the reality of our job as well. Uh, as much as we don't like it, you did what your client yeah. wants to do, and, and you did a wonderful job of you. it. And if you didn't do it, your client would have went yeah. elsewhere. And, there's a way <laughs> and that's the reality of the problem. And there's a way to make things loud without it hurting. There's yes. a way to do that. There's not everything just has to be put to death and everything you can do. You can find ways with you and with different color, different types of compression, different pieces of gear that will add loudness or perceived loudness without actually like, blowing your head off. And that's a wonderful point because that's my, 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 I wouldn't say argument, but my shtick on loudness is that my clients absolutely want it. So it becomes my challenge or our challenge to do it in the most tasteful musical way. and yeah. tasteful way possible. Uh, otherwise our clients are going to go elsewhere and not everybody does it musically and tastefully. We, we do hear a lot of masters that just sound Wow, and if you have a good room, which you both do, I mean, mm -hmm. we, all three of us do, mm -hmm. you can do that in a way that's balanced and you're not a power so we the master of single <laughs> and then on to the next thing. Um, but this is a really great sounding mix. The balance, all the balance is already there in terms of frequency response. It wasn't overly squashed. It has this cool patina from the, the analog tape, the way they hit the analog tape. So they, they did this right. Uh, Eric mixed it well, the band produced it and recorded it well. So we're starting off with something that's already great. So creatively, how do we as mastering engineers enhance that and make it better? And occasionally, it, you know, you put something up and you think, well, gosh, I can't do anything to this. But that's really occasionally. There's usually a bit of room to, to uh, uh, make things sound even that much better in the process. So um, I was going to play a few examples, some snippets of the song, starting with basically the intro through the first chorus, which gives you pretty much the entire dynamic range of the song. And I'll start, of course, by playing the mix, and then I'll play the master for you and discuss a little bit of what my thought process was. So here's their, their mix from Eric. A lot of stuff, they really wanted to keep the warmth on the bass, uh, have a big bass, you know, um, a lot of clarity on the vocal, and to make it really quite uh, big. And as Adam described earlier, it's really hard when people want something loud, you know, to keep all the bass there, especially the subs, without it getting too crunchy. So we have to, yeah, find lots of tricks to do it. This is, this is off the old record. I can't play the new record yet because it's not out there. Mm -hmm. So next time, yeah. we'll be able to show you some of that madness because she, she really wanted to work with women. Um, she's had quite a tough time through her career with men. Um, so trying to find sort of mix engineers that one understood you know, the music that she, she's making, you know, in the sense of experimental art music, um, she was finding quite challenging. So she worked with Heather over here and uh, David Wrench's assistant, Marta, um, mixed the bulk of the record. So it was quite fun, but again, challenging working with, you know, the, the next generation that, like I say, you know, they, they've learned all these things that aren't necessarily what we want as master engineers, so to manoeuvre through it. But this one, I flew up to Iceland and we had the stems and we had the mixes and I sat with Bjork for about four days comping them, basically going through and just making sure that what, what was coming out in the different sections, because her stuff goes on a mad journey, 
uh, was exactly what she wanted. She's very humble with people and let, will let them do their thing. But then at the end, she wants this level of fine tuning. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. And then I brought it back to my studio. I didn't master it up there. Previously, I have mastered up there, but it's not very much fun and very stressful. So I brought it back to my studio to master. More questions? If I can find the right slide. What do you encounter frequently that you wish you didn't? <laughs> <laughs> and what most limits what you were able to do?